Hi, my name is Brenton Hirschner. I'm the product manager of Above Ground Products for OPW. Thank you for joining me for Hanging Hardware 101. The purpose of this video is to serve as an informational introduction into hanging hardware. It is not legal guidance on compliance with standards or safety, nor is it comprehensive. OPW is not responsible for the misuse of the information contained within this video. Changes to legislation or regulations may have occurred after this was filmed, which may not be reflected here. Additionally, specific state or local requirements or those outside the U.S. are not considered. Please consult and refer to the proper authorities before acting on any information in this video. Hanging hardware is a term to identify the components which hang from a dispenser at a motor fuel dispensing facility. These components allow for the safe dispensing of flammable and combustible liquids. There can be other combinations of components, but it typically consists of a nozzle, swivel, curb hose, breakaway, and a whip hose. Let's start by going through what each of these components are and what they do. A nozzle or hose nozzle valve is designed to control the flow of liquids such as gasoline, diesel, biofuels, and diesel exhaust fluid. The most basic nozzle is a manually operated nozzle. The major components are the spout, the body, which everything is mounted to, the lever, the guard, which protects the lever, and in this case is integrated into the body, and the main valve, which opens when the lever is raised to allow liquid to flow. A manual nozzle does not have an automatic shutoff device. It is required to be manually held open during the entire filling operation, and these only stop flowing when the user lowers the lever. These have specialized and limited applications. On the other hand, automatic nozzles are specific nozzles which incorporate a mechanism that shuts off the flow of liquid when the nozzle senses liquid during a refueling operation. I'll talk more about the shutoff mechanism later in this video. Compared to a manual nozzle, these have some similar parts like the body, the spout, the guard, the lever, and the main valve, but also additional components to make it more full featured. Attached to the spout is an anchor ring, which helps hold the nozzle into the fill neck during dispensing, and an anchor spring, which serves the same purpose, but for fill necks not designed for anchor rings. The pickup port is the hole on the bottom of the spout, close to the tip of the spout. This is where liquid is detected during a fill up on automatic nozzles. This is the scuff guard or hand insulator. So I needed gas today, so I decided to show you some of the features of an automatic nozzle and talk about some of the parts. This incorporates a hold open device, which includes a rack with indentations for the trigger to be inserted into, and a spring which helps release the trigger if you want to stop fueling before an automatic shutoff occurs. So integrated hold open devices are um, dependent on jurisdiction, so please consult your state or local authorities uh, for more information on these. Another type of nozzle is called a vapor recovery nozzle. These are specialized nozzles designed to capture escaping vapors as they are displaced by liquid filling the tank. There are two types of vapor recovery nozzles. In a balanced vapor recovery system, the vapors are pushed out of the tank and back into the underground storage tank when liquid fills the tank, displacing those vapors. The most prominent feature of these nozzles is the billows that must form a vapor tight seal on the fill neck to recapture all of the vapors displaced from the tank. Vacuum assist vapor recovery systems use a vacuum pump to draw the vapors from the vehicle and back into the underground storage tank. Both of these nozzles have a vapor valve that actuate along with the main valve to prevent vapors from escaping the vapor path when not dispensing or shut off. Vehicles sold in the US and many other regions, but not all, are now required to capture and recycle the, vehicle, the vapors within the vehicle itself. This is called Onboard Refueling Vapor Recovery System, or ORVR for short. As vehicles without ORVR reach the end of their life and more and more vehicles have ORVR, Many jurisdictions are converting their vapor recovery systems into non-vapor recovery sites. This process is sometimes called decommissioning. During this process, vapor recovery nozzles are replaced by non-vapor recovery nozzles, or sometimes called conventional nozzles. This is for two reasons. The first is the added complexity and cost associated with the increasingly unnecessary vapor recovery systems. And the second is specific vac assist systems. When dispensing, the vac assist system sucks in vapors near the fill neck. When filling an ORVR vehicle, however, there is no vapor, only air. So this added air can sometimes pressurize this underground storage tank. If too much pressure builds up, the underground storage tank vents open to atmosphere to equalize the pressure in the tank. In doing so, vapors are released into the atmosphere as emissions. It's notable that diesel does not generate vapors like gasoline, so vapor recovery has never been required or would be effective when dispensing diesel. Attached to the nozzle is typically a swivel. This not only makes it easier for the user to fill by allowing free range of motion of the nozzle, 
but it also reduces the likelihood for the hose to kink and helps them last longer. Swivels can be made single plane, which only has one rotation of axis, or two plane model, which has a secondary axis of rotation for better range of motion. Connected to the swivel is a flexible hose. We call this the curb hose because it droops down towards the curb when installed. These have a special construction with a conductive element all the way through the hose so that conductivity is maintained from end to end. The hose and all of the hanging hardware must be conductive from dispenser to nozzle tip. That's so when the nozzle is inserted into the fill neck, the dispenser, the breakaway, the hose, the nozzle, and the fill neck are all at the same electrical potential, preventing static electricity to build up on these elements and reducing the likelihood of a spark. PEI, or the Petroleum Equipment Institute, has published a document called RP400, which contains recommended practices for checking the conductivity of the system before putting the system into operation and the frequency which it needs to be retested. Besides material differences required for fluid compatibility, which I will talk about later, some common hose options are low permeation hose, which reduce the permeation of gasoline through the hose and into the atmosphere, and vapor recovery hose, or coax hose. Coax hose is a hose within a hose, which creates a secondary vapor path. This allows the fluid to flow through one path and the vapor to return to the underground storage tank through the other. Another unique characteristic about vapor recovery hose is that they have an integrated swivel into the hose. Hose can also be of the reinforced hard wall type required by UL in the US and other locations. However, Europe and a few other locations use soft wall hose so that can more easily bend around a hose reel retractor. Above the hose is a breakaway. In the event of a user driving off with the nozzle still in the fill neck of the vehicle, the breakaway is designed to separate at a predetermined force to protect the dispenser from damage. The breakaway also has internal valves that seal off passages during a separation to limit spillage. Breakaways are designed as either a single use in which the breakaway must be completely replaced or a reconnectable breakaway, which can be reconnected and reused provided they aren't damaged during the separation event. There are also breakaways designed for vape recovery systems with additional passages and valves to seal the vapor path as well as the liquid path. In some applications, such as when the hose is on a reel or very long hose used at, at a marina, the breakaway needs to be close to the nozzle. A swivel breakaway combination serves these applications. A breakaway is incorporated into the swivel and threaded directly into the inlet of the nozzle. The swivel is required in this case so that the breakaway can be articulated to the direction of the pull force and pulled straight. That brings us to the last component, which serves a similar purpose, the whip hose, or also called the straightening hose. This hose is made of the same construction of the curb hose, only shorter. This is attached between the dispenser and the breakaway. It can whip around and allow the breakaway to orient in the direction of the pull force when separating, similar to a swivel breakaway. Next, let's talk about how and when the nozzle shuts off. But first, it's important to understand the difference between what we call a dead lever and active lever. A dead lever is when the lever will not open the main valve of the nozzle. This is evident by very little force required to pull the lever. It moves very freely. You've probably experienced this when you're filling up and before the dispenser is authorized. An active lever, however, allows the lever to open the main valve. You can tell it's active because it requires much more force to pull. There are many different conditions in which nozzles are required to shut off or prohibit flow. The most notable condition is when the vessel the nozzle is filling is full. The nozzle can't tell the level of the tank directly, but when the tank is almost full, the liquid level rises up in the fill neck, and when the pickup port at the bottom of the spout is blocked by liquid, the nozzle shuts off. So how does that work? The actual shutoff utilizes a trip mechanism inside the nozzle, which is activated by movement of this diaphragm. When the diaphragm moves up, it starts a sequence of events which close the main valve and stop the flow of liquid. This is a complex system that would need its own video, but what's important to know is that when this mechanism is tripped, the nozzle shuts off and the lever becomes dead. The lever will only become active again when the trip mechanism is reset, and to do this, two conditions must be satisfied. The lever must return to the off position, and the diaphragm must return to its downward position. So, what causes this diaphragm to move? Automatic nozzles work on a vacuum system. There's a device called a venturi within the nozzles that generate negative pressure, or vacuum, when liquid th flows through it. It should be noted that this is a different vacuum than the one used in vapor recovery nozzles, but all automatic nozzles, including vapor recovery nozzles, generate this independent vacuum via the venturi to shut off. The vacuum generated by the venturi is connected to the pickup port at the bottom of the spout, 
and also to the chamber above the diaphragm inside the nozzle. When flowing, the vacuum of the venturi is always pulling air through the pickup port. When the pickup port is submerged, the liquid resists flow more than air. This resistance allows the venturi to create a stronger vacuum. Imagine putting your hand in front of a shop vac hose. When you cover the inlet, it pulls a very strong vacuum. When you move your hand slightly away, air is able to rush by and the vacuum against your hand isn't nearly as strong. On the nozzle, when the venturi sucks up liquid up the pickup port, a stronger vacuum is generated, which is transmitted to the chamber above the diaphragm. This pulls up the diaphragm, tripping the mechanism, causing a shutoff, and also a dead lever. When the flow of liquid stops, the diaphragm goes back down to its resting position so the mechanism can be reset when the lever is returned to the closed position. Anything that obstructs the vacuum path while fluid is flowing through the venturi will also cause, cause a shutoff. An attitude device is a device in line with the vacuum path. It contains a ball that can roll around. In certain orientations of the nozzle, the ball obstructs the vacuum path, increasing the vacuum generated by the venturi and causing a shutoff. Something to keep in mind, both liquid shutoff and attitude shutoff rely on vacuum of the venturi to shut off the nozzle. When the flow stops, the vacuum also stops and the trip mechanism can be reset. Even if the conditions that cause the shutoff are still there, like the spout being submerged or the attitude of the nozzle, the flow of the fluid, therefore the vacuum, has stopped. So if I pull the lever, liquid will very briefly start flowing again. A small amount of liquid will come out before the venturi is able to generate enough vacuum for another shutoff. This is called spitting. It's most common when people try to top off their tanks. Another way to shut off the nozzle or have a persistent dead lever is for a mechanism to force the diaphragm up instead of using a vacuum. The most common way this is done is with a no pressure, no flow device. This device spring loads the diaphragm in an upward position, preventing it from resetting the trip mechanism, unless there's enough pressure at the nozzle inlet to force the diaphragm down. This device also is sometimes referred to as a prepay nozzle, or here at OPW, we call it a B-cap. It is now a UL requirement for nozzles with hold open devices to have no pressure, no flow devices. The reason for this requirement is for safety after prepaying. When prepaying with a normal nozzle, the nozzle does not shut off. The dispenser stops the flow of liquid when the prepaid amount is reached. If there's no automatic shutoff, the nozzle could still be in rack when it is returned to the dispenser. When the next person starts the dispenser, if the nozzle is still in rack, liquid will start coming out without the user intending to, causing a spill. With these no pressure, no flow devices, the nozzle will have a dead lever when the dispenser stops. The lever will, must return to its off position and the dispenser must be active before the lever can become active again, thus preventing a spill. Common liquids that nozzles dispense are gasoline, gasoline ethanol concentrations, diesel, biodiesel, and diesel exhaust fluid. These liquids have different physical properties such as density and viscosity and chemical properties such as reactiveness and corrosiveness. So each hanging hardware component is designed specifically for each fluid it's meant to dispense. Sometimes this requires plating bare metal components using different types of metals, different rubber compounds for hoses and seals, and or switching between metal and plastic to prevent corrosion of the hanging hardware components and contamination of the liquid being dispensed. More and more commonly, ethanol is blended into gasoline at varying concentrations. These concentrations are sometimes called gasohol or more often labeled with an E in the percentage of ethanol content. You may have heard of E10, E15, E25, or E85. The UL standard for gasoline also applies to gasoline ethanol blends up to E10. UL specifies additional requirements to satisfy when dispensing ethanol concentrations up to E25, and then even more additional requirements up to E85. Note that if the concentration desired is greater than E10, but not exactly E25 or E85, the standard with the next highest concentration must be followed. For example, E15 must follow the E25 standard and E30 would have to follow the standard for E85 to comply with UL. Diesel, biodiesel, and blends of the two fuels also have its, their own set of regulations. This standard also includes kerosene and fuel oil. Similar to ethanol concentrations, biodiesel blends designate the concentration of biodiesel by a B and then the percentage of biodiesel in the diesel. The standard diesel nozzle can be used for B0 to B5. Additional requirements are to be followed for dispensing up to B20. There are additional requirements for dispensing B99.9 or B100. 
Note that UL does not have a standard for biodiesel concentrations between B20 and B99.9. Again, these are UL standards which may or may not apply to jurisdictions outside the US. Additional requirements for these fuels may also exist at the state and local levels. For this video, the final dispensing liquid to be discussed is diesel exhaust fluid, or commonly referred to as DEF. This is not a fuel and not flammable or combustible, so does not require compliance with a UL standard unless the nozzle is used within the flammable zone around a dispenser identified by the National Fire Protection Association or NFPA. However, DEF is often dispensed in a similar manner as other flammable fluids. It is introduced into the exhaust system of diesel engines before the catalytic converter and reacts with and reduces the concentration of nitrogen oxides, which otherwise would contribute to pollution. This is a solution of urea and deionized water. Because of the high concentration of water, it freezes at a higher temperature than other fluids typically dispensed. Nozzles for DEF have a spout diameter of 19 millimeters. Nozzles that dispense diesel for passenger cars, biodiesel, and concentrations of the two have a spout diameter of approximately 15 sixteenths of an inch. These spouts were originally referred to as leaded because when gasoline contained lead, they shared the same spout diameter. When leaded gasoline was phased out, the spout diameter for nozzles which dispense unleaded gasoline was set to approximately 13 sixteenths of an inch. Vehicle manufacturers also made their fill neck smaller so that a leaded nozzle would not fit into the fill neck of a vehicle that required unleaded gasoline. Nozzles which dispense unleaded gasoline and gasoline with ethanol concentrations still use this 13 sixteenths spout diameter today. Finally, truck stop nozzles intended for quickly filling large diesel tanks such as those in semi-trucks have a larger spout diameter which is a maximum of one and a quarter inches. Finally, I recommend that you read and follow the documents that the Petroleum Equipment Institute or PEI published describing recommended practices which are helpful when installing and maintaining equipment at a dispensing facility. PEI RP500 is the recommended practices for inspection and maintenance of motor fuel dispensing equipment. PEI RP400 is the recommended procedure for testing electrical conductivity for fuel dispensing hard hanging hardware. PEI RP1100 is the recommended practices for the storage and dispensing of diesel exhaust fluid. And finally, PEI RP300 is the recommended practices for installation and testing of vapor recovery systems at vehicle refueling sites. So, this concludes the brief hanging hardware 101 video. Thank you for your time.